want to introduce someone to you who was influenced by the coach of our keynote speaker. And he's going to introduce our keynote speaker to you tonight. I want to introduce Shannon Jolly, if you'll come forward, the head football coach of School of the Osage. First, I would like to thank Kathy for the opportunity um, to be here tonight. Kathy Wieson has been monumental in my growth, uh, my spiritual health, my spiritual development, um, my professionalism as a coach, as a husband, as a father, and um, I owe a lot to Kathy. Uh, we've been through quite a bit. When she comes and finds a coach that's a little resistant, I had an FCA leader ask me in Springfield one time, he said, aren't you in mid-Missouri? And I said, yeah, and he said, um, so you're, you know Kathy Wieson? I said, yeah, I know Kathy. And he said, what makes her different? Like, what's the deal with Kathy Wieson? And uh, I just told him she had patience, and valuable patience with people, and, um, and a passion that was relentless uh, for her faith. And so, Kathy, I appreciate it tonight. Um, I have to be honest, when, um, when I heard Neil Jeffrey was our speaker this evening, I called Kathy immediately and said, hey, can I introduce Neil, please? It's a little bit out of character of something that I would do, but I had the opportunity to listen to Neil previously at one of the American Football Coaches Association, our national conference. I think it was in San Antonio. And um, I don't think what Neil knew at the time when, when I volunteered was we've both been influenced by a coach, and it happens to be the same coach. When I started going to the football convention each year, it's our national convention, I had a young coach on my staff, Brock Silvers, come to me and he said, hey coach, let's go to Orlando to the national conference. And at the time I was resistant and, and wasn't for sure if I wanted to travel or commit that much to a football conference. The next day he showed up with a plane ticket. He said, hey, we're going to Orlando. So as I talk about this circle of influence, I want to make sure that we understand this young coach who was a first year teacher and a coach had an amazing influence on me by taking action and inviting me to go to this conference. So when we started attending the conference, um, the executive director at the time was Coach Grant Taff. He used to be the head coach at Baylor University. He's in the Hall of Fame. He's got a bio and, and a sheet that's a mile long. And um, so when I got to the conference and I started seeing this man lead six and 7,000 coaches, it was clear to me that this was a different conference. So when through the American Football Coaches Association, we attended these conferences, and each year I'd come back and I'd listen to Grant speak. One of our assistant coaches one time said, hey coach, do you notice something strange? And I said, what's that? He was a younger coach. He said, all of these great coaches, these Hall of Fame coaches, are coaches of integrity. And I said, yeah, I got that. And I started to understand more and more what being a coach of integrity meant. My path and my spiritual faith is a, is a rocky one. And so being patient and having someone like Kathy in my life to, to help mold and educate me was valuable. So we go up and we listen to Grant Taft speak each year. And you'd watch him stand in front of six and 7,000 coaches at a time, and he had complete presence and complete control of the room. And it was amazing to me that this gentleman in his 70s could walk up and demand that type of respect and his presence was so valuable. Year after year I kept coming back and listening to Coach Taft. I got the amazing opportunity outside in the lobby one day to approach Coach Taft and speak to him. And he gave me about 30 minutes of his time while his daughter was waiting, I think, to spend the same time with him. And it got me more and more interested in things that the AFCA had to offer. And one of them at the time was our Fellowship of Christian Athletes breakfast. Now this breakfast is at 6.30 a.m. each morning, and uh, so I signed up for it and I attended. Neil happened to be one of the speakers that morning and I got to listen to him. It's one of the most powerful messages that I've ever had. And I look back at that and I think about the power of a coach. It's very humbling and sometimes nerve-wracking to think that you may have that power as a coach or maybe have that influence is probably a better word. So when I stand up here and introduce our keynote speaker, he's been a major influence on me for several years, and we've never met. I had the opportunity to give him a call today, 
And I said, hey, Neil, if you got a chance, I'd like to speak for you just a little bit. So he was gracious enough, gracious enough to call. And we had a conversation, and it was, felt like to me it was like having a conversation with an old friend. I brought up Coach Taff, and I talked about the influence that he's provided on me, and then he started in. And I thought the amount of influence that he provided for me in my career, and all I got to do was sit out in the crowd and listen to him, and then to have Neil here, who's played for him, been in the locker room with him, and shared those types of things, is unbelievable to me. When I talked to Kathy about this, I just wanted maybe to give a different perspective. We watch videos, we have podcasts now. Um, you can get on the internet and you can read about every coach and every person. I got the unique opportunity through Neil to live this power of influence from his coach and bring that through. I had the opportunity to write a letter to Coach Taft not too long ago. And I shared with him the power, the influence that he had on me and sitting here tonight being involved in the fellowship of christian athletes and the organization and how much it's given back to me it's humbling um, to be up here to introduce our keynote speaker neil i appreciate the short conversation that we had earlier today and uh, your influence has been amazing and i want you to know that it hasn't stopped here at the podium and um, as i continue to grow and get better i thank you very much and we welcome you to our banquet neil jeffrey please Thanks. Thanks, Coach, and I'm honored uh, to be a part of this. I'm honored to be here and get to uh, share a little bit. Now, as I, as I begin, um, I got to warn you something about me. This is obvious. You're going to notice. It's just a fact, so I got to say it up front that I, I happen to be a stutterer. Now, all that really means is that uh, I stutter. <laughs> And uh, I don't want to brag or anything, but actually, I'm, I'm a, uh, a very good stutterer. I stutter really well. Now, you stutter as a speaker guy, and of course, initially, I know it has to be weird for you. I mean, I do enough speaking, I know it has to be weird to be sitting out there, and you just heard that your speaker for the next 30 minutes is a stutterer. And you're thinking whatever you're thinking. You're feeling sorry for the guy, or you're thinking, why do we have to have the stutter? I don't know what you're thinking, but... But let me set your minds at ease in one sense, though. In one sense, being a stutterer really is no big deal uh, unless you want to say something. <laughs> and believe me, it's going to be a factor. And all of my life, it's been a factor. I can honestly say if stuttering has anything for me, it has definitely made my life exciting in that I never know in any situation I'm in if I'll be able to say something or not. And believe me, I've been in thousands of situations all of my life where I've had something to say, wanted to say it, and just had an exciting time trying to get it said. It, it affected me as a kid. Now, I don't stutter as well as I used to stutter as a kid. Uh, as, as a kid, I was a great stutterer. I'm not, uh, I may have stuttered as well as anybody has ever stuttered. Uh, I'm not sure if they keep those kind of stats or not, but as a kid, I couldn't talk. Couldn't say anything. I couldn't say my name, couldn't say hello, couldn't talk on the phone. Uh, in fact, I'd be at the house when I was a kid, and the uh, and, uh, uh, phone would ring, and every once in a while I tried to answer the phone, and uh, I did this a hundred times. I'd get the receiver, pick it up, get stuck, couldn't say anything, start to say, I just hang up on them. And I, I used to call people all the time. They answered the phone. I never got, I forget that, uh, 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 hanging with them. But it affected me in every area of my life as a kid. It affected me as a student. I mean, all the way through school. Everything about school was a challenge for me. Uh, reading was a major a challenge for me. A speech class was a major adventure for me. Uh, Spanish class. Now, if you can imagine me stuttering in English, you should have heard me stutter in Spanish. It, 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 was, it was impressive. But it's always affected my life. It has, as a kid, it affected me. As a student, and also as an athlete. Now, uh, uh, I played football, and I happened to be a quarterback. Now, most of you know Normally, a guy who plays that position, usually uh, you need to be able to talk. You got to call plays in the huddle, you got to say huts to the line of scrimmage, you got to change the play at the line of scrimmage. And of course, all of that happens in highly stressful, time sensitive situations. Well, for me, it was just always exciting. Now, 
In high school, when I was in high school, all you were allowed, time-wise, in the huddle to call a play and get everyone up on the line screaming and get the ball snapped was 25 seconds. That's all you got. Well, often 25 seconds just wasn't enough uh, time for me to say all the stuff I had to say and stutter. So we would constantly have a situation that I'd be in the huddle, I'd be calling the play, I'd get stuck, start the stutter, 25 seconds runs out, referee throws a flag, we lose five yards for the layup game. So I'm costing us a lot of yardage. So my coach, uh, actually I went to high school in uh, Overland Park, I can't just shot him at the South High School. And my coach, John Davis, devised a system whereby if I was on, on the field, I never had to say anything. And we did that in the huddle. We had a split in. He always stood right beside me in the huddle. His name was Steve Thomas. Steve called every play for me in the huddle. He'd say the formation. He'd say the play. He'd say the snap count. He'd say everybody break. So basically, I didn't have to do a thing in the huddle because Steve said everything for me. In fact, my coach had said, Neil, you just be on a knee in the huddle and kind of act like you're doing something. But he said, he said, don't open your mouth because it just confuses everybody. So Steve said, everyone in the huddle, we'd break the huddle, hustle up in the line of scrimmage. And once we reached the line of scrimmage, I had a fullback who always lined up right behind me in the I formation. His name was Stu Cropper. Stu would say all of the huts for me at the line of scrimmage. And it was so unique at the start of every ball game just to watch that initial reaction of the defense when, when Stu would be saying those huts, because he's in a stance, you can't even see him, and uh, I'd just be smiling, kind of understand, you know. <laughs> and it was, who's saying those huts? Well, things come, but it's always affected my life. All, uh, all through high school, it affected me. Uh, I went to Baylor to play football, and I get there as a freshman. My first practice at uh, Baylor, the first day of two days, I'm stuttering extremely well. I'm having a hard time uh, calling the plays, and it was affecting everybody because all the players and coaches are wondering what's up with this freshman from Kansas who can hardly even talk. I mean, it just, it, it, and what made it worse was uh, I'd actually failed to mention uh, to anybody that, uh, that I was a stutterer, and so it, 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 but it just created a real tense situation. Everybody was, well, after about half of that first practice, Coach Taff, who was, uh, you just heard about, a great guy, great man, uh, loves the Lord, uh, um, loves kids. He, he saw the uh, situation, uh, what was happening there, the uh, impact on me or on everybody. So he calls me over on the sideline, and we're talking about my problem. And I say, Coach, I'm a stutterer. Uh, it's not always as bad. Uh, sometimes it's worse. And we uh, discussed it. We talked about it. He asked me a bunch of questions about stuttering. One of the questions he asked me was, was he asked me if I stuttered when I sang? Because I thought to myself, I said, no, sir, I can't explain this, but for some reason, I can sing without stuttering. He said, Neil, won't you try this next time? Just a try step in the huddle and kind of sing a play to the guys. Well, I was only, I was only a freshman, and I was obviously desperate, so I, as soon as it was my time again, I stepped in the huddle, and I was only about a 180-pound freshman, and I stepped in there with all these big linemen and these big upper class them, and they just kind of sang them something like uh, slide right x 49 gy cross something like that it, it it loosened everybody up and it was so much easier for me to sing the play instead of stuttering through the play i kept singing the play and after a while it was kind of neat and kind of novel and it was kind of fun everybody was getting into this thing and after a while i started asking if anybody had any requests, they would hear me sing the play to, and I tried to sing it for them. And, and we stayed with that for several practices until one of our centers, Aubrey Schultz, he walks up a few days later and tells Coach, um, Coach, all the guys have decided that we would rather hear him stutter than have to listen to him sing. But, but I say all of that just so you'll know, hey, I'm a stutterer. I'm going to stutter, but know this. When I get stuck and start the stutter, and I will, just wait a minute because something's coming. That's my point. Here's what I want to uh, do tonight real quick. I want to share just, uh, you know, FCA. I, uh, I love FCA. I've been involved in FCA all my life. I love sports. I've been involved in sports all my life. Uh, sports, in one sense, has dominated my life. I love sports, but sports didn't change my life. I love FCA. I've been involved in FCA. I was on staff years ago with FCA. My dad was president of FCA back in the 60s. I love FCA, but FCA didn't change my life. 
Jesus Christ changed my life. Powerfully changed my life. Now, he used my love for sports and my involvement in FCA to help me realize the things about life, about God, about Jesus, about how God loves us and has a plan for our life and wants to do something incredible in us. Even a guy like me who struggled all of his life with his speech, always felt inferior, always felt never good enough, God has a plan for you. Here's what I want to give you tonight, real quick. Four things. Four things I got uh, kind of from a coach. But more than that, through, through sports, but ultimately, through my relationship with Jesus Christ, which, by the way, changed my life. Here's one thing I got. A first thing I got from a coach that changed my life. I heard, I heard some things that changed my life. And one of the things I heard as an athlete, I heard this whole idea of a sport. You know, sports is all about getting knocked down and getting back up. Sports is all about challenges. Sports is all about just having to struggle with something, having, having somebody better than you, and you're just working hard and coming back. I just heard all that. All of my life, I've struggled with my stuttering. All of my life, as I said earlier, I've always felt inferior. All of my life, I just assume I'm not as good as everybody else. I've always struggled with that. But in sports, you always hear from a coach, hey, son, you can do this. Because kids, Often just think, I'm not this good. I can't do this. And one thing a coach does, he just inspires. He just fires you up. He believes in you more than you believe in myself, uh, in yourself. I always had a coach, always had a teacher, always had a preacher, always had a mom and a dad who believed in me more than I believed in myself. Long before I believed in myself and just hearing from men, Neil, you can do this. Uh, a powerful thing. Suppose I thought... Since I got this stuttering thing, I can't do this. When I got to high school, I guess I was a sophomore in high school, I heard about the student government thing in my high school. And I decided, you know what, maybe I need to be in student government. I've been involved in sports all these years and have the relationship with these experiences. Maybe I should branch out, meet some new people, have some new experiences, and be involved in student government. Actually, it was my dad's idea, but, but I thought, you know, this is a good idea. So I decided I'm going to do this. And then I found out. If you're going to be elected to student congress, it was called, in my high school, you had to stand up in front of your whole class and make a speech. Now, as a sophomore in high school, I was such a good stutterer, I couldn't even say a silent prayer without stuttering, <laughs> much less speaking. There's no way. So here was something I would like to have done. I didn't think I could, so I didn't even try. You know what? Most kids have something in their life that they think is going to hold them down and defeat them and just keep them from being everything maybe they have always dreamed of being. Uh, here's what I learned. Hey, God allows things in our life not to hold us down and to defeat us. Even struggles, he allows things in our life ultimately to make us even greater. I've read hundreds of biographies of, of athletes because I was always inspired by men who got, or women who got knocked down and came back who even grabbed. One quick story, that just, uh, I love the story. 1939, a guy stands at the 50 meter rapid fire uh, pistol competition at the World Championship. It's where he shoots the pistol at 50 meters. He wins the gold medal in the World Championship of uh, 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 1939. Everybody assumes he's going to win the gold the next year. 1940 in the Olympic Games. But there's a World War in 1940, so there's no Olympics. He's a sergeant in the Hungarian army, and one day in a battle, hangman blows up near his right hand, shatters his right hand. He loses his whole right arm. After the war, he goes home, he gets suppressed. Uh, everybody assumed, uh, this is assumed that this great champion will never shoot again. I mean, I've read this story, it's amazing. He struggles, he gets down. All of a sudden, one day he decides, you know what, I'm coming back. Shooting's my passion, it's what I want to do. He gets his pistol, he goes out in the woods of Hungary, teaches himself how to shoot all over again using his left hand, less dominant eye. He shocks the world, shows up at the 1952 Olympic Games, 50 meter rapid fire pistol competition, uh, using his left hand, less dominant eye, 
wins a gold medal, sets a new world's record. He does it again in the Olympics of 1956. Every Olympic book you can read that mentioned great Olympic champions always mentioned the name Caroline Tarkovs. He was great in 39, got knocked down, got defeated, came back. He was even greater in 52 and 56. Here's the point. I believe God allows things in our life to, to uh, 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 tough things in your life, struggling things in your life, stuttering things in your life, not to defeat you, to ultimately to accomplish his great plan in your life. Uh, Cicero said this. Now, I'm not exactly sure who Cicero was, but he, he's one of those one-name Latin Roman guys, like Plato and Socrates and all those guys. And I learned in school, if a one-name Roman Latin guy says something, you listen to what the guy says. Cicero said this, the greater the tragedy, the greater the triumph. You know what the Bible says? James 1, 2 through 4. Consider it all joy when you encounter various trials. Knowing that the testing of your faith is going to produce endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result that you might be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Seems to be saying, if a person wants to be perfect and complete, lacking in and nothing, you're not born that way. You know how you get that way? Through the struggles of life, through the knockdowns of life, <laughs> through the hard challenges of life. And the end result is God does something only he can do. That is so incredible. In the end, you become, because of this struggle, perfect. Everything you were created to be, complete. You do everything you were made to do. And third, Lacking in nothing. Imagine a human being who discovers the power of Almighty God because God is bigger than anything we're facing in life, including stuttering. God is, is bigger than stuttering, and the end result is he's going to use this to make me more like him, perfect in Christ, complete, do all he wants me to do, and lacking in nothing, which simply says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, I discovered in sports that, hey, you get knocked down, you get back up. Having learned something, having tasted something, that makes you even greater. In FCA, through a Bible study, through, through all of a sudden my relationship with Jesus Christ, I discovered that God is greater than anything I'm going to face in life, even death, because Jesus has even conquered death. And in result, you know what? The great apostle Paul, the great apostle Paul has something in his life. He called it a thorn. <laughs> something he didn't like. It was a struggle. And Paul says, he asked the Lord three times, Lord, take this thing away. You know what? I've asked the Lord uh, hundreds of times in my life, God, why do I have to stutter? Why can't somebody else stutter? Why does it have to be me? He asked the Lord, Lord, th three times, take it away. I said, Lord, take this thing away. But God told Paul, and I guess he's also telling me, Paul, Obviously, I could take this thing away. Hey, it'd be simple for me to do that, but Paul, I'm not going to do it. But Paul, you're going to discover because of this thing that my grace is sufficient for you like you would never have known if you didn't have this thing. And you're going to also discover that my power is actually made perfect in your weakness. So Paul says, I would rather boast in my weakness that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He's actually saying, hey, if I got a choice between not having a thorn because I don't have a thorn, I don't experience his grace and experience his power, or having a thorn but because I have the thorn, I get the grace and I get the power in my life, he says, give me the thorn. That's the bottom line. Every kid needs to realize, hey, God has made you to do something great in you. And I look back over my life and think, this whole struggle in my life, this whole stuttering thing, God, was it necessary? You know, first, uh, first Peter 1 6, I just kind of saw this recently. First Peter 1 6, it says, listen, I got to move on because my time's, because uh, uh, I have four things I'm going to give you. Uh, uh, he says, first, first Peter 1 6, in this you rejoice, all of your trials. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. If necessary. Hey, you know what? Jesus, when he was going to the cross, 
and in the garden, he asked God, the Father, he said this, Lord, is there any other way? Seems like he's saying, God, is this necessary? God told him, yes. This stutter, I look back over my life. God, was this necessary? God seems to be saying, son, uh, maybe it hurt. Maybe it was a struggle. But yes because I've used this to accomplish everything I, I wanted to. You know, now, as an old guy, I hadn't, uh, toward the end, now, it's not over yet, but I'm uh, 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 on that side of the thing. You know, I look back over all my life, I realize what God has done, and you know what? I think in some way I would actually choose stuttering because I realize what he's done. I heard from a coach, son, get up. get after again. I heard from God through a relationship with Jesus Christ that, son, I'm going to use you to get something great done, even you. Here's the second. Now, uh, you know about that. Just as a sophomore in high school, we got high school kids uh, uh, in the back back there. As a sophomore in high school, I guarantee you, you don't ask me to be the one who comes and speaks tonight. But God does. Here's the second thing I heard from a coach. I call a dream. Uh, I heard something that changed my life. I caught something that changed my life. You know what I caught? I caught a dream. One of the things sports does that's so powerful, it helps a kid dream about being something great and doing something great. Man, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a quarterback. Man, that's what I wanted to be. That's what I wanted to do. I love quarterbacks. I, I read about quarterbacks. I watched them, and I wanted to be. I dreamed up being an uh, All-State at uh, Southern Miss South High School in football. Win a state championship was my dream. I wanted to go to Baylor. Uh, being an All-American at Baylor, win a conference, uh, that was my dream. Dreaming about being in the NFL. Dreaming about being all pro. Dreaming about being the, in the National Football League Hall of Fame. I dreamed about being the greatest quarterback that ever lived. I fell a little bit short of some of that stuff. But, but you know, I'm not sure I'd get as far as I got if I didn't have that dream. You know that. Man, a dream gets a kid. A kid gets a dream, and all of a sudden the dream gets the kid. And he starts dreaming of what he can do, who he can be. And that dream just makes him start early and stay late. And all of a sudden he's got a reason to say no to some junk he's got to say no to, or he never becomes that, and some things he's got to say yes to. The dream, everything starts with the dream. Everything. That, I love this story real quick. i got to hurry. But just one little, uh, uh, quick. This is one of my favorite stories of all time. About dream. I read this in two Olympic books. 1920, the fastest man in the world was a man named Charlie Paddock. He just won the gold medal in the 100 meter dash in the Olympic Games because that man is always known as the fastest man in the world. He comes home to America. He's a national hero. He, he's making appearances and speeches all over the nation. He makes an appearance at East Tech High School in Cleveland, Ohio. In that speech, in that assembly, with those students from that high school, he makes this statement. He says, who knows, there may be an Olympic champion in this room today, but first you've got to have a dream. First you've got to have faith. First you've got to believe. First you've got to work hard. Well, he, he finishes his speech. He's on the side of the stage. He's answering questions, signing some autographs. One of the kids in that high school walks up to Charlie Paddock and says, Mr. Paddock, I want to be an Olympic champion just like you. He stopped, looked at the young man and says, son, you can't. If you dream, if you have faith, you can do this. Well, this kid grew up. 1936 Olympic Games in Berlin, he wins four gold medals. One of those is the 100-meter dash. He's the fastest man in the world. Of course, his name is Jesse Owens. He comes home to America. He's the national hero. He's in a convertible, in a parade, in Cleveland, his hometown, going down Main Street. A bunch of kids rush the car. They stop the car for a little bit. He's signing all with these kids, talking. One of the kids around that car says to Jesse Owens, Mr. Owens, I want to be a Olympic champion just like you. I love this about this story. He's a big-time world-class athlete, stops his world for five seconds. I knows a snotty-nosed kid from inner city Cleveland, Ohio, and said, son, uh, you can do this. Son, if you dream, if you have faith, you can do this. Well, this kid was so skinny, everybody called him Bones. Bones went all the way home. He tells his nanny, nanny, I'm going to be an Olympic champion just like Jesse Owens. 1948 uh, Olympic Games. Man, he was a 100-meter dash. In the Olympic Games, the fastest man in the world, 
from Cleveland, Ohio, is a man named Harrison Bones Dillard. There's something about having that dream. You know, I wanted to be, I, 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 I played some of the NFL. Actually, I really didn't play in the NFL. I was in the NFL for a couple of years. I, I, didn't, I didn't, didn't, didn't do a whole lot. But, but my third year, I'm with the Giants up, up in New York, and I'm about to get cut. And I know I'm about to get cut. I mean, it was just, it, it was going to happen. It was inevitable. So all of a sudden, that moment comes, and the guy gets me, and I go to the court. Uh, a coach's office, and he, he, he was nice. He said, hey, you're a fine young man, but you're not going to be going to the weather. So I'm cut. I'm flying home. Dream's over with. One of the lowest moments of my life. I thought I had failed. Man, it's over for me. I'm never going to do it. I'm, and actually, I'm walking out of his office back to the dorm to get myself to fly home, and all the other guys are on the way to practice. And I'm kind of crying, and I'm trying to get myself together, and I feel like an idiot. I thought it was over, and I had failed if I could have only seen things from God pers God's perspective. God was saying, son, you think it's over? <laughs> son, it's only just begun. I got a whole nother thing I'm going to do in your life, with your life, through your life. And son, yes, you had a dream of being a great athlete. I've got a plan and a purpose, just like the guy shared earlier. I've got a purpose for your life. I'm going to use you to do something great in this world. That represents. God has something special for every kid out there, and FCA is a vehicle God uses to get them to a point to discover a relationship with Jesus Christ, how great God is, and God has something. He, he, you know what? Just about every, every FCA staff, a person, and Kathy is just like this, I think, as well, is an athlete who was a coach who had a dream of being the greatest in the sport, whatever it is, but God had something greater he wanted to do in them, with them, for them, and through them. I caught something. I caught the purpose God had for me being here on this earth. Third thing, real quick, I saw something in a coach that changed my life. You know what I saw? I saw some godly men and women who loved Jesus, who loved their wives, loved their husbands, who were raising good, godly kids, and they were doing life well. When I was a kid, as I said, I loved quarterbacks. I always wanted to be one. I loved, I loved, I loved watching them. My uh, all-time hero quarterback was Johnny Unitas, the old guy at, at, at the Colts. He was my favorite. But I loved Starback and Star and uh, all those guys. But when I was a kid, the coolest quarterback was a guy named Joe Namath. Uh, remember Joe Namath? Everything about him was cool. I mean, he was good looking. He was tall, about 6'5", 225. He looked cool in his uniform because that's all that really matters. It's how you look at him. I mean, he looked cool. cool. Had that uh, low uh, face mask down here. Uh, uh, he wore white shoes. Nobody had white shoes back then. He wore white shoes. He wore pantyhose. I mean, I just, I just, everything about Joe was cool. I mean, he, he, I'd watch him on TV. He'd take that ball, drop back, stand there like a gun. Oh I'd watch him on, on TV. Here's what he'd do. He'd be in the huddle. He'd call a play. They'd break the huddle. He'd walk up behind the center. He'd stop behind the center. He'd look around like this, and then he would do something. He would straighten his shoulder pad. He'd go like this. He'd go. Then we'd get into the center. I saw that and I thought, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> I'm an eighth grade quarterback. Next day in practice, we break the huddle. I walk out, I'm standing, I'm looking around. I don't even know what I'm looking at, but I'm looking, that's what Joe did. <laughs> then I do one of these, you know. I saw a picture of Joe on the sideline. He had this, this he's right-handed, but, but uh, his left, this is Sports Illustrated. His left hand was up like this. He had two pieces of skinny white tape, one around this set of knuckles and another around that set. I saw that and I thought, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. So I got me some tape and scissors and cut them up and put some, because uh, I show up at practice the next day and everyone said, hey, what's wrong with your finger? I didn't matter. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't matter. Because Joe did it. Hey, there was a time in my life as most kids, I see all these stars and all these athletes and I'd give anything to trade places with them in a heartbeat I would have, just to be famous and wealthy and, and, and so good at what they did. But you know, as I lived life and learned about life and living and love and all kinds, you know what I realized? I actually realized I didn't want to exactly be like so many of those guys. 
Because sad to say, so many of those guys did sports well. They just didn't do life well. You know what I realized? I wanted to be like my dad. Wasn't wealthy, wasn't strong, wasn't famous, wasn't anything. But you know what? He loved God with all of his heart. He loved my mom. He raised his kids. And you know what? I know how a man's supposed to live because I watched a man live life well. You know, somebody made this statement. And this is a great statement. And this is the influence of FCA, influence of a coach, an influence of a Christian in the midst of an unchristian world. Somebody made this statement. I forgot who it was. Somebody famous said this. It may have been me. I'm not sure. But, <laughs> but somebody said this. The only thing God can use to make a man uh, uh, is a boy. And what does a boy learn how to be a man? He's got to watch a man be a man. He's got to have a man in his life. Same for a little girl. She's got to have a lady who she watches, who impacts her. God bless me with a dad in my life. I know what a man's supposed to do because I watch me. What does a boy learn how to love Jesus with all those hard money? He's got a dad and a mom that loves Jesus with all those hard money. What does a boy uh, learn how to love the word of God and respect it? And, 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 and study the, he's got a mom. Where's the boy learn how to pray? He hears his mom and dad pray. What does the boy learn how to work hard and be responsible and, and, and take initiative and all that stuff? He's got somebody in his life. What does uh, the boy learn how to treat a woman the way a woman's supposed to be treated? He's got a man in his life. He's saying, son, this is how you do it. I mean, once I, I, I sassed my mom one time. I was in junior high, and I kind of sassed her and said some things I shouldn't have said. And, and she just turned and walked away. And I'm thinking, okay, yeah, I'll show mom. Well, dad showed up. I don't know why I'm saying this because this is a little bit over the edge maybe, but he, he stuck his nose on my nose. I can still remember the fire in his eyes. Here's what he said. This is a great line. I've actually used this line on my son. He said this, son, long before your mom was your mom, she was my wife. And I don't let any man talk to my wife the way you just talked to my wife. And then I didn't even see it coming. You know what he did? He took that big old right hand, and you know what he did? He slapped me upside the head. And then as soon as I could hold my head up again, he slapped me upside the other head. Now, I'm not saying you ought to slap your kids. I am saying it worked pretty well on me. I know what a man's supposed to do and what he should not do. You know why? I had a man in my life. He said, son, that's not what God's man does. The power of, hey, what does a boy learn how to live? How about this? What does a boy maybe ultimately learn how to die? Where do you learn that? You got to watch a man die. I watched my dad die. He got pancreatic uh, cancer, which is a bad uh, type to get. He got the worst type. So he got three months to live. He lived a year and a half amazingly, but he was in and out of the hospital, lost all that weight, sick, lost all of his hair, couldn't taste anything last, suffered sick, but then he died. And you know what? When my time comes, I know what I'm supposed to do. You know why? Because I watch a man live well. I watch a man love well. I watch a man lead well. When my dad's time came to suffer, I watched the man suffer with respect, with integrity, never complaining, never said, why me? His idea was, hey, I've been faithful to Jesus all these good years. Why would I be anything less now through the struggle of my life? And when my dad's time came to die, I watched the man die well, honoring God all the way to the end, loving my mom, uh, and holding her hand until Jesus took it, uh, uh, so to speak. I know that's supposed to be done. You know what? That's influence now. Here's the impact of FCA. I had a dad like that. Most kids in our schools do not have a dad like that. It's the greatest tragedy in America and in the world is the absence of godly men. Thank God for one, the Church of Jesus Christ, but two, thank God for the Fellowship of Christian Athletes which is going to have a coach, a godly man, a godly woman, in the midst of the greatest mission field on the planet, the junior high, high school, and college campuses of the United States of America. And these kids are close to these men and women, and they see them, and something happens, and they see a picture of doing life well. 
I saw something that powerfully changed my life. It's what the Apostle Paul said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11 when he says, hey, you guys follow me as I follow Jesus. That's the influence of FCA. And the last thing, number four, real quick. I'm done with this. Here's the last thing. I felt something from a coach that powerfully changed my life. You know what I felt? I felt loved. I felt like somebody who cared and loved and valued me and was there on my team, good, bad, or ugly, I felt loved. The greatest motivating factor is love. Always has been, always will be. That's what the Bible says about love. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never fails, never abides faith, hope, and love. These three, for the greatest of these is love. God loves us with an ever uh, uh, lasting love and unconditional. He loves us. You know, it's awesome to have somebody in your life who looks at you and says, you know, I love you. That's awesome. It's also awesome to have a person in your life who says that, but then he does something that shows how much he hugs you. One of the things my dad did well for us boys in our family is he'd say it, hey, son, I love you. But you know what he'd do? After ball game, I'd walk out of a, at that game, and he, he'd walk up and just wrap us in a big old bear hug. That's some of the greatest moments of my life. I've always been a Baylor fan. Always loved Baylor. If you were raised as I was loving uh, uh, Baylor, uh, you were also raised with a real strong dislike for the University of Texas. Because Texas beat us in the 50s and 60s, 17 years in a row in football. My whole growing up life, my dream was to play at Baylor and play against the University of Texas. Well, my freshman year, Texas, 1971, Texas beat us for the 15th year in a row, 44 to 7. My sophomore year, they beat us for the 16th a year in a row, 17-3. My junior year, 1973, we played in Austin, Texas. I'm talking Memorial Stadium. I'm talking a great place to play football, great game. Texas scored at the last second of the game and beats us 56-20. to 20. Uh, <laughs> A 17th year in a row. Now I'm a senior in 1974. We're playing in Waco. We're having a good year. They're having a good year. It's a big showdown on the Brazos River. Our stadium... I only held about 48,000 people. We jammed about 54,000 people. On the third play of the game, I threw a pass to receiver on the left sideline. He catches the ball. He breaks the tackle, goes 67 yards for a tackle. We're ahead seven to nothing. I'm not sure we had led in 17 years, and here we are ahead. Because everybody's thinking maybe this is the year we finally beat Texas. Well, you know this. The rules are emphatic. If you score, you have to kick the ball to the other team. As we kicked the ball to Texas, they were in the wristbone back then. They're huge. They take the ball just from uh, March the they score with seven cents. We the ball have a good drive. We get stopped. We get a punt. We punt. They take the ball. They just methodically. They march. They score. 14 said, we the ball have a good drive. I threw an interception. As I remember, it wasn't my fault. The guy ran the wrong route, obviously. But they, but they, they take the ball. They, they score again. 21 to seven. We the ball have a good drive. We get stopped. We get a punt. We punt. They take the ball. We finally stop. They kick a field goal. It's now 24 to seven. Texas is ahead in its halftime. Our fans are leaving the stadium by the thousands. The start, the start of the second half, they get the ball first. We stop them. They got a punt. We block their punt. We go in and score. We end up, we shut Texas down. Uh, they didn't, uh, didn't score another point. We end up scoring 27 unanswered points. We end up winning that game 34-24 to this day. It's still the greatest comeback victory in the history of earth. <laughs> For us at and Baylor is still known as the miracle on the brasses. I mean, just, and for me as an athlete, my best day ever as a quarterback. Greatest thrill of my life. But the thrill of that whole experience was walking out of that locker room, and there's my dad, followed by my mom. And my dad walks up to me, my hero. My dad comes up to me and just wraps me up in a bear hug. You know how awesome it is to have the greatest day in your life, and your dad was there, he saw it, he says how proud, but he didn't have to say it because you feel it in that hug. It's indescribable. To have somebody just who loves you like that, it's, it's unbelievable. Well, the year before that, we played TCU for home, at, at homecoming. We're behind 34 to 7. 11 minutes left to go in the game. We start another amazing comeback. We scored three touchdowns really quick. Now 34 28, we're still behind by seven. If we could somehow get the ball, a drive down score, kick it, maybe we could even win this game 35 34. We get the ball with a minute and a half left. Start this amazing drive. I mean, I'm hitting passes all over the field. We get down on the eight-yard line going in the score, uh, 15 seconds left. Uh, threw a pass to a guy on the flat over here and on the side. He catches the ball, and the film showed after the game. If he had just turned up the sideline, he'd have walked in the end zone, and we'd have won the game. 
But for some stupid reason, he, I'm still in counseling for this. He, uh, he breaks in the middle. He's tackling him inbound, just yards away. From, uh, we don't have a timeout. Uh, clock's run, seconds left. I'm thinking you got to stop. The, so you, uh, you do what you do. You're down the ball. So I get the ball. Of course, now you're just down it. Then you have to throw a pack. I threw the ball. Uh, I didn't stop the clock, except it was fourth down. Now, if you're non-football types, that's not a good thing. <laughs> that, that's a major mistake. I'm not going to waste the play. Get play. I just threw the game away. You've never lived if you walked up a football field with 40,000 pairs of eyes all looking at you, and they're all thinking unchristian things. The lowest moment of my life as an athlete. I failed. I blew it. I'm, uh, it's all about my mistake. I'm weeping in that locker room. I'm so disappointed. I can't describe what it was like to walk out of that locker room. And there's my dad. Followed by my mom. My dad walks up to me and just wraps me up in a bear hug, and my head was on his shoulder. I was just weeping. I was so disappointed. Here's my point. On the greatest day of my life as an athlete, I got that hug. On my worst day as an athlete, when I failed, when I blew, when everybody was down on Jeffrey, I still got that hug. That's the way God loves us. That's the way God loves you. That's the way God loves everyone. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Every kid on every campus in the world needs to hear, needs to know, needs to see, needs to experience. There's a God in heaven that loves you, that dies for you, who will forgive you of your sin, cleanse you, make you a new person in Christ, and do something awesome in your life, with your life. And the end result, you get heaven and glory forever. That's the mission of the Fellowship of Christians and athletes and what it does. And thank God it was there because when I was a sophomore at Shawnee Mission South High School, Overland Park, Kansas, I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And it changed my life. Hey, I think in just a moment you might have a chance to maybe invest in this ministry. My testimony is it's worth an investment. God bless you for being here tonight. Uh, thanks, and I'm honored to be a part of this. Thank you.